Welcome to Menopause Reimagined. I'm your host, Andrea Donsky. I've been a nutritionist for 19 years, and I'm also the co-founder of WeAreMorphous.com, a company that helps to empower you to take control of your health and symptoms with nutrition, lifestyle, supplements, and research. Today, I'm speaking with Bonnie Wisner. She's a nutritionist and digestive health expert. She has helped hundreds of people all over the world get to the bottom of their chronic digestive issues so they can live their lives without the discomfort, embarrassment, and inconvenience of persistent symptoms like chronic constipation, gas, bloating, and heartburn. Today, we're talking about poop, IBS, and your health. Now here's Bonnie. Welcome to Menopause Reimagined, Bonnie. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. I'm looking forward to our chat today. So am I. All right. So we're going to be talking about IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. And this is something that I've had for many, many, many years uh, since my late teens, early twenties. And I thought it'd be a good conversation to have because as we go into perimenopause and menopause, so many of us are having or seeing changes in our digestive health. And since you are a digestive expert, I thought we could even start with, you know, what's happening to us as we get into this phase of life and then really dig deep into IBS. Sounds great. All right. So let's start. So what is happening to our digestive system as we go into perimenopause and menopause? So really what's happening to our digestive system is a function or a result of what's happening to our system altogether. So anybody listening to this who's in this part of our life can certainly relate. So you know that our hormones obviously fluctuate during this time of life. And one of the results of the fluctuations is when, for example, estrogen dips, we know that the hormone, the hormone cortisol tends to increase. And what that does to us from a physiological perspective is it actually affects which part of our nervous system is activated. Um, so when your cortisol spikes, as I'm sure you know, your stre- you go into a stress response. You're more likely to be in sympathetic mode. Our digestive system, like most other parasympathetic um, functions, happens in the parasympathetic part of our nervous system, which is rest and digest. So we're so at this stage of life, I believe the reason that women in particular experience such fluctuations and such um, interferences in terms of digestive function and even new diagnoses of IBS at this time frame is because of that. I believe that's a big, big contributor to why this is happening. So you might start to feel as a result of this more bloated than usual. You might start to feel Um, very sluggish in terms of your motility pattern. You might have been somebody who went to the bathroom once a day at least, and now it's like four or five days is passing. You're extremely uncomfortable. It's contributing further to this bloating that I just mentioned. Or conversely, you might be somebody who um, now is, you know, worried about leaving your desk because you, or your house, because you must be going to the bathroom five or six times a day right? So we don't know why it affects people differently in that particular sense, but we do know that um, the effect is due to a number of factors, but speaking as Andrea just did about why this is suddenly um, more prevalent for us when we reach this um, stage of life, it's physiological. So the stress response causes this, but also if you stop and think about it, um, the things we go through at this time of our life tend to be stressful as well from the outside Mm -hmm. Right. So why don't we start with what the definition is of irritable bowel syndrome? Okay, that's a great place to start. And I'll comment on why. So first of all, IBS is um, a functional disorder. So it's not structural. um, And it's not really considered a disease. And it's now understood to be a dysfunction of the gut and brain axis, meaning that people who are officially diagnosed with IBS actually have been recognized to have um, an interference or a dysfunction of the messaging between our gut and our brain. And what happens and what that actually means in real life is that the result is that um, the, the gut brain axis, first of all, picks up any sort of movement along your digestive tract, right? That's how our body messages itself. With people with IBS, that movement is actually perceived as pain and discomfort. So it's a highly sensitized reaction. It's known as hypervisceral sensitivity. And it's that's a a reality of what happens. And that's due to the gut brain access and the connection there. Your gut is known as your second brain. We have a tremendous amount of 
nerve pathway, as you know, Andrea, between the gut and the brain. So we didn't know this. This is really interesting, I think, in the sense that it helps us understand how to help people who are struggling through this chronic dysfunction, because even 10 years ago, we really didn't have confirmed understanding of this. I remember in my early 20s, I, I must have been probably 22, 23, early on, and I was having so many gut issues. And every time I ate, that's really the reason that led me down the path to even become a nutritionist. And I was having so many issues every time I ate anything, I would get gas, I would get bloating. I was so, so uncomfortable. And I went to go get it checked out, mm -hmm. as we all should. Anytime mm -hmm. you have any issues, you always want to go get it checked out and rule everything out. And I remember my doctor, they sent me to a specialist and they did so many different tests. And in the end, I'll never forget this, Bonnie. I was sitting in this doctor's, the specialist's office. I, I wasn't familiar with this doctor. And I remember I sat across from him and he said to me, you know, we've ruled everything out. So we're going to call this IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. And most of the time it's really all in your head. Oh my goodness. I know I could project literally. <laughs> it's so frustrating and we're still there. I mean, that was so long ago and I experienced something similar in my background. And unfortunately, most of my clients are experiencing the same thing. And I, I, if you're listening to this, I want to say two things. First of all, it's important to self-advocate. So if you do feel like something's wrong, that's never an acceptable answer. It's just IBS and oh, well, you know, it's they no longer necessarily say it's all in your head. Um, even though that really does speak to an early perception that there was some connection, but that's not the answer because it doesn't help people. Um, but what's interesting about it is, unfortunately, if you're listening to this, you could probably relate. If you've gone through this path, I wanted to say two things. Number one, um, do not self-diagnose IBS because even though it's not considered a disease and it is a, considered a functional disorder, um, I don't mean to be like the naysayer nay nay of bad news or whatever, but if it's not properly if it's not properly addressed, it's never going anywhere. So the big, I would say, in a list of ten, the top mistake that people make is actually self-diagnosing this. So definitely urge your doctor to send you for the test first of all that Andrea referred to, because there are other conditions such as inflammatory bowel disease, colon cancer, etc. More what we would consider treatable disease states that um, need to be handled differently, right? But unfortunately, the, the joke, half joke, half serious part of this is that, unfortunately, we are still in a place where it is slightly predictable. I can tell you what will happen. Your doctor hopefully will be receptive and responsible and send you to a gastroenterologist who will do a great job at doing their job, which is to assess and diagnose or not confirm a non-diagnosis of any of those perhaps more concerning things, but it doesn't really, and, and they'll often at the GI's office conclude, yeah, you have IBS. Here's what's going to happen. Predict 90% success rate on this prediction. Unfortunately, they will hand you literally a crumpled- A pamphlet. A, a pamphlet. Paper, <laughs> a, something <laughs> called the low FODMAP diet, or they'll send you back. Actually, that's what will happen. And or they'll send you back to your family doctor where you will receive the same information. Here's the thing. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, the low FODMAP diet, maybe we'll get into that in a minute. I want to say a couple of things first to continue yeah. this part of the conversation. This is really important because we um, go to our doctor's office in trust, right? And the fact is, I work with a group of doctors in Toronto where I'm located, um, both family doctors and GIs. And the bottom line is, if you ever actually have a conversation with um, a doctor, they'll usually tell you that they don't know how to manage IBS. They will, right? They're able to help you to an extent. There's certainly medications some people are put on, laxatives if you're constant, et cetera. But the bottom line is that it's all surface symptom management at best and really resolving it um, or understanding how to manage it day to day to day requires a much more multifaceted approach than just here's a piece of paper with the most complex diet on the planet, you know, and et cetera. So it's also interesting to note that <clears throat> this isn't a small issue. 15% approximately of people across North America um, struggle with IBS or are di properly diagnosed with IBS. <clears throat> Excuse me, in Canada, where I'm located, we actually have one of the highest um, diagnosis rates. 
in the world. And again, because of Andrea, myself, and all of you listening, this is relevant to us. That number, if about, let's call it 15% of the overall population is diagnosed with IBS, we have, I've seen numbers where in perimenopause and menopause, that number of the total population flips up to almost 38%, which is tremendous, right? Which suggests that at this stage of life, because of what we said at the beginning, this becomes a very prevalent concern. Um, yes. And also just to, of interest, um, because you're not crazy and it's not in your head, um, nearly 70%, 65 to 70% of all confirmed IBS diagnoses are actually females. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny that you said that. And that's why I knew you said the pamphlet, because that's exactly <laughs> what my doctor had said to me. He gave me a pamphlet. He said that, you know, I, you know, it's all in your head, but here's what you can do. It's, I, I can't help you. There's nothing I can do to help you. And, you know, basically help yourself. And at the time I was like, so I was young, right? This was a long time ago. And I remember walking out of there going, now what? Like, yeah. what am I supposed to do? So I love the fact that you're working with doctors who are unable to, and again, they don't learn about how to treat this in medical school, right? Because their their job is to do other things. So they have nutritionists, dietitians, or people that work with them that can help. So I love the fact that you're working together with the medical community to help women yeah. in this stage of life. Okay. So now a natural for me, where we go from here is women who are listening or our audience who's listening going, okay, great. But how do I know if I have it? Or how do I know I even need to look into this? What are symptoms that we need to be looking at? Obviously you mentioned gas and bloating, but really you know, at this point, so many of us have those symptoms. So what specifically should we be looking for in order to know, okay, I need to take the next step to go to my doctor? Yeah, fantastic question. So um, I'll, I'll simplify it. Like there is something called the Rome criteria and it's, it's a, it's a pretty long list, right? In terms of how you'll really be diagnosed in your doctor's office. I obviously don't do the diagnostic part, but from a symptom perspective, chronic constipation, chronic bloating, um, so bloating once in a while, even once in a while, every few days is considered normal because we all respond differently to different foods. It depends on your combinations, the time of day you're eating, what your stress level is. These actually do affect yeah. our rate of digestion. So that I wouldn't worry too much about. But if you find that you're bloated when you wake up, you're bloated every day. By the end of the day, you're unbuttoning your pants and literally feeling like you were, if and when you were ever pregnant, um, that's a problem and that is worth investigation. Constipation is interesting because constipation presents differently for different people. Sometimes, even when you have what you would think of as diarrhea, so a runny stool type of situation could actually be caused by or related to constipation. So it gets a little confusing, but monitoring, I, I tell people the first thing you should do is actually literally monitor what's happening with you so that you could see what your own pattern is. Because believe it or not, we're busy. And it's sometimes, even though it's so bothersome, it's hard to really see and be objective. So the first stage is to, even for a couple of weeks, really monitor what specifically is happening for you in that poop department. Um, am I bloated when I wake up? Am I bloated after I eat something? Am I bloated at the end of the day? Um, do I have pain? Um, so abdominal pain um, is also a really chronic symptom, right? Um, but you should be, again, this is just like when I say should, I put it in massive quotation marks, but most of us don't necessarily understand that um, a healthy bowel pattern involves having a bowel movement every day. Your doctor might consider healthy between and one between one and three bowel movements. Um, sorry, every one to three days is what I wanted to say. Um, and that's fine. I, I can even accept that because there's exceptions to every rule, but we eat every day. Well, we need <laughs> to poop every day. And we process every day. And the same way you wake up in the morning and you never miss a chance, you never wake up without having a pee, right? You should be waking up, in my opinion, and also starting your day with a bowel movement in an ideal sense. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I got my little poop emoji. Um, Love it. I don't know. We want to hey, be. I have mine too. Where'd it go? Oh, do you have yours too? There we go. Yay. Uh -huh. <laughs> nutritionist and our little digestive. <laughs> I love that one. Our gut, my little gut. <laughs> Um, 
so I think, and this, for those of you who are listening, I'm just showing you, it's, it's on YouTube, you can see, but really it's the props that I'm always showing. Um, so I think that, at, so I know that we need to be pooping every day. And I always tell our audience, and for those who are listening, they're not new to me saying this, we need to be pooping every day for so many reasons. Number one, to get rid of the, the undigested food, our metabolites, our estrogen metabolites, our hormone metabolites, you know, every, you know, these are, these are things we need to be getting out of our body so they don't get reabsorbed into our body, bacteria, pathogens, all things that we don't need in our body anymore. So going to the bathroom every day is really critical. And if you're not going to the bathroom every day, we're going to talk about some things that can help you uh, yeah. get there. And then of course, like, like Bonnie's saying, if you have it's something that's chronic, please, please, please go speak to your doctor and get it checked out. Because even things like chronic bloating can be, th can lead to other things, right? Other serious things. So I always want you to go get yourself checked out, ladies. We know we always talk about ruling things out and then coming back and going, oh, okay, this is a symptom of perimenopause and menopause. And that's something that I cannot stress enough. So, okay. So, and so Bonnie, so like you were saying, those would be the main things that we want to look at. How can we help ourselves? So you were mentioning before, which is interesting that it can get a little complicated. So like, Loose stools can actually mean that you're constipated. Like, so can you give a little bit of an overview to our listeners as to what is considered? And again, I'm going to say this with a big, you know, grain of salt quotation, normal, but we're going to call it common um, versus things that are not so common. Yeah. So maybe I'll even call it up and share my screen to show people if that's okay. But um, sure. in my world, <laughs> from my point of view, um, for the reasons that we mentioned earlier, um, having a bowel movement, sorry, once a day at least is probably, should be your normal. And I say, again, I, I always, always put the word should into massive asterisks, right? But it is something that I think is um, quite relevant. Also, um, you know, watch what that stool looks like. So, and, and the characteristics of the experience, believe it or not. So if you probably haven't spent a ton of time thinking of this in an organized fashion. So when I'm saying start tracking these things, um, am I having to push? Like, you know, normally a stool, if, if your digestive system is working like a charm, everything that happens, happens well. It's a cascade, right? You chew your food, it gets digested, you know, there's certain... Um, things that happen with enzymes and stomach acid and blah, blah, blah. It goes down a cascade. It's a step-by-step -step process and ultimately um, gets broken down. The nutrients get broken down and absorbed by your body the way they're supposed to. And then you eliminate waste as Andrea alluded to. That is really a simple, simple process that our body is phenomenal at. So if anything in that cascade is being, is sus suspect to you. So including the end result, am I pushing Am I like going to, this is very common too, going to the bathroom, you know, walking in and out like three or four times within an hour because I feel an urge, but nothing's coming out, um, those types of things. Or I'm going to the bathroom and little pellets or coming out one, you know, little by little, or it's just too liquidy and I have to go so many times to feel the color, the color, um, the consistency. So I'm going to just show the Bristol stool chart. Yeah. Okay. So here, I just pulled the first thing that came up on the internet to show. Great. Um, are we, we're sharing now? Yeah, you can go ahead and share. You okay, can share thanks. your screen. So <laughs> let me just quickly show the first thing that came up. So as you can see, there's quite a range. I mentioned those hard um, lumps if you're constipated. Unfortunately, this is something that you might be seeing quite often and it's quite uncomfortable. Um, lumpy sausage, like where we sit, and then going right down to, to liquid, which unfortunately with IBS, um, prominently with di diarrhea. So there's different types of IBS. Somebody might see this every single day, right? Yeah. Um, so let me just quickly interrupt you. Sorry, Bonnie. I just want to explain for those who are listening and not watching this on YouTube, oh, yeah. something called the Bristol stool chart. And it goes from the, they kind of break it down into seven types so type one is with, with what Bonnie was just talking about. It's separate hard lumps. So little, you know, little hard lumps of stool. Then you've got type two, which is lumpy and sausage-like. And then you have type three, which is a sausage shape with cracks in the surface. Type four, like a smooth, soft sausage or snake. Type five, soft blobs with clear cut edges. Type six, mushy consistency with ragged edges. And then there's type seven, which with was which is what Bonnie was just alluding to as well, which is liquid consistency with no solid pieces. Yeah. And 
So Bonnie, why don't you tell everyone what types people should really be looking for to aim for on a daily basis? For sure. So going back to what I'm suggesting, if you're struggling with this and you haven't yet gotten a diagnosis, um, observation and tracking for like a period of about 14 days would be very helpful for you. Google Bristol stool chart and look for type three, type four stools are the norm. If you more, and again, even those of us who are having, who don't have IBS, who have normal stool patterns can occasionally have any of them, right? But you should consistently have type three, type four stools. I'm going to stop I'm um, sharing and type and those are just those are more like the smooth sausage or snake like right yeah. and then also at the end of your your bowel movement not have to wipe anything yeah that's an important yeah point. yeah if you're you know using lots and lots of toilet paper and keeping Costco in business that's another sign to be aware of for sure for sure listen and we know that um what we're talking about seems very pedantic but the reality is that this is part of self-advocacy. If you want to go to your doctor and, and get their help to try and figure out if this is in fact irritable bowel syndrome, and it's important to do that, then you need to go to them with information and only you'll have that information. Yeah, thank you for that. That's great. So let's talk about some things that we can do to help. So somebody now, they know they have IBS or they suspect they have it, or they've been confirmed that they have it. What are some things that they can do to help their symptoms? Sure. So let's start, Andrea, with a conversation about diet. So the <laughs> nutrition piece um, is really important. And it's also really varied depending on where your diet sits right now, right? And that could be a very large range in terms of the listeners right now. So you could be somebody who, you know, is just exploring these things and your diet by and large because of your schedule, because of habit, might be full of prepared foods, might be, you know, restaurant foods, et cetera. That's fine. Um, but just be aware that a more whole foods diet tends to carry more um, more quality of fiber or even amounts of higher fiber, which is really important. Um, and also, the, sorry, I'm going to take a quick step back. A lot of the conversation, if you even Google IBS, right, the first thing that will always come up is what you should avoid if you have IBS. But just know that, and I do sometimes um, start with people with elimination protocols as well, because one of the things we want to do is give you comfort while you try and figure out what how to address yeah. this for you. But it is very multifactorial. And please, if you remember nothing else but this from the nutrition conversation, um, the best success at managing IBS requires a very liberal diet and a very complete diet. And so unfortunately, what happens initially happens in reverse, particularly for people who try and manage this on their own. You know, we, because if you Google it, you'll immediately come up with things like the best research diet, which is low FODMAP diet, which is just quickly for people to understand. And that is what's on that piece of paper that exactly. Andrew and I talked about. Um, it's really just, it's the best research diet, but it's also really the only well-researched diet. Nevertheless, it is uh, by definition, a, a bunch of food categories that actually are highly fermentable. That's all you need to know for the purpose of this discussion. Um, they basically have been proven to take a long time to sort of sit in your system and ferment and cause gas, which causes the bloating and the discomfort and even constipation and diarrhea. So that is definitely a food reaction, but in my opinion, it's, it's still um, just addressing a symptom. There has to be a reason why this food is sitting longer for you than for somebody without IBS. And so just simply eliminating um, FODMAPs is not the answer. In fact, many people who, and this is also, I think, a really important piece of information I'd like to convey, most people who enter into a FODMAP um, elimination protocol do it for on their own. Now, again, the piece of paper is their only guidance very often, and they stay on it much beyond the prescribed protocol, even by research standards. So it, by intention, was always only intended to be a diagnostic tool on its own and a six-week protocol. That's essential to, to take away from this conversation. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Sorry, Bonnie, I just want to interrupt you because I, before we go too far, I want to make sure that everybody's following and, and understanding what we're talking about. Sure. So when you say highly fermentable foods, what does that mean? These are foods, by the way, that we want to avoid that may be not and when we say avoid initially to create that comfort for us, but these are things that could be causing the issue for us. What does that mean for the listener? So there's certain types of carbohydrates that actually take longer. They, if they're sitting along your digestive tract, um, will ferment, meaning they will create, like I said, gases, which can cause the bloating, et cetera. So if you want a list of them, things like, uh, unfortunately, they also happen to um, appear in some of our healthiest foods for our gut, healthiest foods for our gut. So things like um, onion, garlic, mushrooms, apples, apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? Watermelon, grains are like things like wheat, barley, rye. So this is the wheat part is interesting. Well, any of those are interesting because that often gets, you know, conflated with the whole gluten conversation. Um, nuts and seeds, not all, but many nuts and seeds. Um, a lot of really healthy fiber rich pulses or legumes, right? So things like black beans, kidney beans, chickpeas, lentils, um, a lot of lactose containing dairy products as well are highly fermentable. Um, and a lot of processed foods because they contain a lot of sugar alcohols. So any alcohol that ends in literally OL um, is also a highly fermentable and concerning um, food within the FODMAP protocol. So even though I personally do not um, ne I never actually advocate for that approach. I understand it. And if you're really struggling and you are doing this on your own, I urge you to go to the Monash website and follow it according to protocol because there's three phases of it. And the last thing I want to say about it is just that people will often stay stuck in the first phase. And in my experience with a lot of clients that I've worked with, it elicits food fear over the long run. They become very concerned about how to reintroduce. It is a very well-designed tool, diagnostic tool, that if you do it properly, you very well might end up with a short list, hopefully, of foods that actually are concerning for you. Um, and then you can move on from there. So Monash University is out of Australia and maybe explain that you, you, you kind of, you're saying follow the Monash um, protocol, right. but what does that mean for, again? So this, this low FODMAP diet was established, was researched and very well researched and um, outlined um, through a group of researchers in the nutrition de science department at Monash University. So that's, and they have an app and they've made it really simple. And there are a lot of resources. If you Google, there are a lot of low FODMAP resources. In my opinion, that is the most reliable one. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so to recap then is to, there's, there's a, you can go check out Monash University, check out their protocol. You don't advocate for necessarily cutting out all the foods they talk about, um, but maybe just foods that are specific to you that could be causing those issues for you and your digestive system. And, you know, I'm a big fan of personalized nutrition anyways. Like I think it's great because what works for me may not work for you and vice versa. Right. Yeah, so I think hundred percent, I actually have a different approach with diet. Um, like I tend towards, um, a more hypoallergenic anti-inflammatory approach um, because again in my professional opinion a lot of the foods first of all most people abuse the low FODMAP diet that's really part of the reason um, but in a bigger scope a lot of the foods that I just mentioned we know are actually super beneficial to um, the vitality and diversity of our gut microbiome which is really important to overall gut health um, so not just treating IBS symptoms, but actually our overall person health. Um, so when you, say, when you say abusing the FODMAP diet, do you mean they're just on it for too long? Is that what you much mean? Much too long, much too long. And again, through, Mon through Monash, their own research um, has more recently um, identified and suggested that there's a problem with that because long-term elimination of the foods I mentioned, because they do contribute so positively to uh, diversity actually causes more harm than good. It's really an important thing for people to know. Hmm. No, that's a good point. And a lot of them are prebiotics, which feed the good bacteria. Yes. Garlic, yeah. onions. You're talking about things that are that are 
prebiotics for our gut health. So right, and something that I know you are um, very concerned and always um, positively espousing the fiber rich foods, right? Oh. So, yeah. The 25 to 35 grams, at least, and I know that's a number we just throw out there, that 25 to 35 grams, yeah. but at least it gives everyone a goal to reach. But yeah, very important that we get enough. And, and you mentioned a great point about individualized nutrition. So that's actually where it becomes really, really helpful to work with somebody who's knowledgeable in this area, because it could differ from person to person. But I think um, the end result for the food piece, the nutrition aspect should be that your goal long term should always be to have the most vibrant, complete diet. So your goal is not to figure out, oh my gosh, what do I need to avoid kind of for the rest of my life? Your goal is actually for your gut, for IBS and for overall health to figure out how to achieve the most um, vibrant and complete and liberal diet. And just to segue out of that for a minute, um, when it comes to IBS, that then allows us to actually address some of the other facets that contribute to um, improvement and management of IBS from a personal perspective. Because as we started talking about early in this discussion, we know now that IBS is actually a, a disorder, a dysfunction and disorder between the gut and the brain, which has very little to do with what foods you're eating, in fact, right? So the only way that it affects it is how it affects the length of time that something would be in your gut, how it affects the, um, the resources that your body might, um, you know, like secrete like enzymes or stomach acid, like those things become very relevant. But at the end of the day, managing IBS must be approached in a multifaceted um, way. So stress management, I think Andrea and I would both agree. Oh, is, yeah especially for women our age, yeah. um, because of what we talked about earlier, the crux of it um, would be the first thing. It's also the hardest. So we hear you, we, we empathize, we're there with you ourselves. Um, but it's not so much controlling everything that's happening in your life as controlling your physiological um, response. So things in that realm might be something as simple as a deep breathing practice just to sort of temporarily trick your nervous system into thinking that things are maybe better than they're going in your overall day. And that's very important. You know, and I just want to emphasize something that you said before. And when you're talking about diet, and Bonnie's referring to eating a whole foods diet. She's referring when she talks about diversity and, you know, in our diet, we're talking about eating the rainbow, different colors, different types of foods, because different foods affect our gut microbiome differently, right? So you're talking about and we know as we get into this phase of life, protein, lots of veggies, low glycemic fruits. We love berries and the berries are so yummy in this phase of life, legumes yeah. and carbohydrates and nuts and seeds in more moderation. And again, to what you can handle, right? To what your gut can handle. And these are things and staying hydrated and making sure you're getting all that fiber. So that's what's important. And when you're looking to your fruits and veggies, right, Bonnie, what should they be looking for to eat when it comes to fruits and veggies? So a low glycemic a Fruits and veggies are obviously um, probably the healthiest form of carbohydrates that we can include in our diet in the biggest amount. And the reason is because from that, from a gut health perspective, we derive all of our dietary fiber. That's where fiber exists. So um, any, honestly, any low glycemic fruits and vegetables, but any, truly any, are better than not having them. And then if you want to take it up a notch, the low glycemic uh, approach. So in case you're not familiar with what that is, any fruit and vegetable, fruit or vegetable or grain or nut or seed even, that has the highest amount of fiber per serving. So you can easily Google this. Um, it's not rocket science, you know, Google glycemic index, choose the ones that have the highest amount of fiber per yep. serving. For example, because I like to throw out easy examples. Please. Yes. Um, raspberries always come to mind if you like them because, and you can do them all year long through frozen fruit as well. Raspberries are, I think, eight grams of fiber in a half a cup, which is extraordinary. It's quite high. Um, kiwis are also good. Apples are great. Berries, 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 always berries. And berries, it's not, berries have a lot of other values as well. Oh high in antioxidant, right. But um, 
a rule of thumb, if you're not sure and you're not by a computer and you're out at somebody's house, whatever the case may be, strive for the most amount of rainbow colored foods in your diet. So fruits and vegetables. Second tier, again, trying to always look for the low glycemic. So a rule of thumb to make that easy is anything fruits like berries and seeds for sure. Um, but after that, anything that um, you have to peel usually has more fiber um, to eat. Um, sorry, anything that you don't have to peel actually has more fiber. So eating the peel versus let's say something like a banana or a mango or a papaya, which are fruits that you would not normally eat the peel on, right? Um, just as a rule of thumb, those are usually higher glycemic than. Yeah. Uh, One thing I love too, I do love it, although it has a peel, is I love oranges because well, yeah, yeah. vitamin C. But oranges, even the membranes, oranges actually have a nice amount of fiber as well. Yeah, which is yeah. amazing. Oranges and green bananas. So not, you don't want overly ripe bananas. You like yeah. the green bananas because that's resistant starch, again, helping with those probiotics. So, you know, and, and it's important to eat the rainbow. And you bring up a good point, Bonnie, because when we eat the rainbow, and, and here's a, you know, some homework that I'm going to give all of you who are listening as we tend to eat the same things over and over. And again, you know, ha my hands up, I'm, me included. And it's really important that we try and push ourselves out of our comfort zone to try at least one new vegetable or one new fruit that you haven't had in your diet. And it may be hard to do it on a weekly basis. Maybe you can do it on a monthly, on a biweekly, but try to have something new that you haven't had before. So I'll give you an example of something that I've been doing and really trying to push myself. So I started now trying experimenting with things like Jerusalem artichoke because that's an awesome prebiotic and I put it into a dressing. So I, as you know, Bonnie, and for many of you listening, I'm in the right, middle right now of writing a book uh, on menopause, which was, uh, it's being published by Simon & Schuster, which I'm very excited about. And it'll be out in 2025. And we have a whole section on digestion. And I know Bonnie's going to be involved in our book, writing it, which I'm very excited about as well. And right. I know I'm so excited too. <laughs> and um, so, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about this, but really trying to push yourself. And I'm going to have a dressing with Jerusalem artichoke in it, which is delicious. So Ooh. that's my vegetable that I kind of have been very much into these days, jicama, just trying different things that I normally don't have. So I, when I go to the grocery store and the reason, and it's hard, hard for us sometimes too, to get ideas. So when I go into a grocery store and I like to go to different types of grocery stores and I'll look and I'll be like, oh, and I'll take notes. I'll be like, oh, I haven't tried that before. I'm going to try that one. Right. So I'm always trying to push myself into doing different things, different colors different you know different foods that I haven't tried before so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask all of you you know this week when you're listening to this podcast try something new that you haven't tried before to get that variety and when you have the variety and you have that rainbow everything has its own beautiful antioxidants its own beautiful nutrients that you're not getting by always eating you're always eating the same things so you're not getting the different types of nutrients that you get when you value yeah. your food I couldn't even agree more so I want to be sensitive <clears throat> and as I know you do too, and just address the elephant in the room, which is I know that if you are in a category of person, you know you have IBS, you've had it for years, you know that a lot of these foods, or you're afraid to try new foods because of foods, pardon me, because of how they might affect you, we get that. There's still a way to do what Andrea is suggesting though, because she's 110% right about this, particularly as it relates to IBS and gut health. Um, we know two things. Fiber and variety are literally the contributors from a nutrition perspective that um, improve that mo my vitality. That's, that's just a fact. So another way of doing this is among the category of foods that you, you know you can tolerate right now to do it this week, um, just try and get at least 30 different plants, including herbs. So this is how easy it gets. Seriously, if you make the effort, including herbs, into your diet a week, 30 different plants a week. It is so easy, um, even with restriction. It's actually is not, a, not as hard as it sounds. So I would add to what Andrea is saying and just like even working with foods that you already know you can tolerate if the idea of trying new foods right now is frightening to you. Yeah. And also keeping budget in mind too. Right. And we're very sensitive to that too, given what's going on in the world and inflation yeah. and costs. But yeah. you know, what's interesting too, is when you, for your, for the benefit of your health, when you try different things and you'll know really quickly if it doesn't agree with you or if it does. Right. So buying not even don't buy a lot of it. Maybe you're buying one unit of it. Right. Just yeah. to see if it's something that you could tolerate. Yeah. 
So yeah. I think, and, and you can incorporate all that. So when you're saying that, Bonnie, 30 different foods, you know, you might be thinking, whoa, that's a lot, but can you give examples of how oh they God, can incorporate it so it my, doesn't become this overwhelming thing? I'm so glad you asked. No, literally my favorite thing. This is because, because I understand when you hear that, it, even for people without issues, it sounds like a lot, a lot, right? But it's so not a lot. So bowl of oatmeal, right? The oats are already a grain. Which but is not the not the pre store bought with lots of sugar oatmeal. We're talking no about sugar that. added oatmeal, yeah. just the oats. Oats, I be right? clear. Okay. Um, you know, if you can do it's still cut great. If you can't, you're pressed for time, no problem. But just yeah, not like the brown sugar and cinnamon, you know, like the packaged ones. Never ideal. Um, so oats, you can add a little dollop of um coconut yogurt. You can add a little dollop, and when I say dollop, I'm talking teaspoon, tablespoon, whatever, of almond butter, peanut butter, whatever it is that you mm, like. I love nut butter. You can add um, chia seeds. You can add hemp parts. You should add hemp parts to, to oatmeal because they're not very high in protein. So we're up to six, right? Pumpkin seeds, seven. Um, you can, if you wanted to sweeten it just a touch, add a little bit of honey. That's another cinnamon point. too. I'd be like cinnamon, oh, Andrea. Way to go! Up next, Nine. Cinnamon. Let's go. One more for ten. <laughs> Sunflower seeds or whatever you like. No, what am I talking about? I didn't even talk about berries. Three different types of berries. You're already at thirteen. Like seriously speaking, easier than it seems. And my mind was going to like making a big salad, then of putting course. a whole bunch of different vegetables and your salad, and adding hemp hearts to your yeah. salad. I love yeah. adding hemp hearts. You get those omega threes. You get some fiber, some protein. Yeah, some adding Me some yeah. So I don't know how much time we have, but I just wanted to also impress upon people that for the IBS picture, um, honestly, the food piece is the enhancement piece. It's the making sure you stay well. It's the variety, the fiber um, that we just addressed. Addressed, But in reality, um, there are so many things that get overlooked in this process. So for example, we talked about mindfulness or stress management, um, trying to get our nervous system in check in the right format so that it can rest and digest. Um, supplements, I'd, I'd like to hand it over to Andrea in a moment to talk about some supplements that can be very helpful um, for IBS. Also keeping in mind connected to that stress piece, how you eat actually dictates the, how the cascade of digestion flows. So if you're in a hurry all the time, you're not chewing your food well, um, you're not telling your body to secrete stomach acid to help with the breakdown. You're not telling your body to secrete enzymes that's going to help break down carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Essential in order for your body to go ahead and process the last three, ph three phases of digestion. So that's very simple, but very effective. Some things that aren't often connected or paid attention to are, and I'm not saying you got to join a gym or become like a high intensity interval trainer or marathon runner, but the way we're sitting right now doing this day in and day out, for example, isn't great. So even just making a conscious effort, this would be challenge number two to you actually, to stand up, get up from your desk, just walk around for five, 10 minutes at the most. Go for a 30 minute walk every day if you can. Movement is actually very intimately connected to motility. Not surprising, but we don't, we're not conscious of it when we're trying to figure out our symptom management piece of it. So flip your perspective a little bit and concentrate on that. It's really, really important. Um, and then the last piece, well, there's several other pieces actually, but the last thing I want to make you aware of that you can perhaps get some information from. Um, Andrea, I'll shamelessly plug right now. I run a free Facebook group called Shift Into Healthy Habits for Digestion. And the reason I invite you there is because some of the things I'm about to talk about aren't easily Googleable. And I have a lot of re free resources there about this. But sleep and IBS are actually very, very intimately connected. And of course, for all of us, Andrea, myself, and you going through this whole hormonal fluctuating phase of our life, we know that sleep is so important. So sleep, quality and quantity impacts um, irritable bowel syndrome from a symptom evolution perspective, but irritable bowel syndrome symptoms, constipation, um, diarrhea, inappropriate timing in terms of processing and absorption 
also impacts our sleep. And if you really want to fix the sleep piece, you're also going to address sort of the, the other piece of it. Yeah. Sleep is huge. And certain things, you know, when we talk about getting that better night's sleep and making sleep a priority, one of the things we talk about Bonnie a lot is not eating too close to bed because when we eat too close to bed, our body's busy digesting as opposed to healing and repairing itself. So not eating at least three to four hours before you go to sleep. And I don't mean little small snacks. I'm talking about eating a full meal so yeah. that when you walk away from the table, you've had your, your dinner, that you're not going to bed within three hours of that. Now, sometimes it's not possible and I understand, but if you can, you know, 80% of the time do that, you, and you'll probably feel a big difference. Like I know if I go to bed too close to eating, I'm waking up in the middle of the night. I'm like tossing and turning. I might get a stomach yeah. cramp, indigestion. Yeah. Like I don't personally get indigestion, but I know some people do, especially if you lie down. So yes. you're so right. And the thing is, we all have to give ourselves some grace. Like Andrea said, it's not always going to be possible. But yeah. as a rule of thumb, one of the things we do is we resist things that seem too simple. And again, relating it back to both our experience as women right now at the age we are and the stage we're at, and also the IBS piece, mm -hmm. I would encourage you again to monitor and observe what happens with your sleep. Because we do this. I do this with clients every single day. And sleep is often one of the first things that fixes when you change some of these daily habits, like the one you talked about with respect to timing. On the timing piece for IBS, I would also say that and this could work one way for one person and a different way for, for the next person, because it is individualized. But if you're a type of person who tends to um, graze throughout the day and you're constipated, we know that there's actually a body function called the migrating motor complex, which requires you to have space between meals in order for the motility signal to kick in and tell your body it has to move food down the digestive tract that's how our body messages itself oh she's eating time to go right so that's something um, to take into consideration or conversely if you're somebody who has a hectic hectic schedule or you've tried intermittent fasting for other reasons but you struggle with ibs you might want to look at again just spaced out meals i think that's a great suggestion and it's a great suggestion for IBS and digestive issues, but also just in general is, and I tend to graze sometimes during the days, like I do a lot of intermittent fasting and then I'll graze between my eating window. And, but when I don't graze between my eating window and I sit down and I try to do this as much as I can sit down for that larger meal, really focusing on protein. Cause that's what, cause that's yeah. what keeps me nice and full is and for many of us in this phase of life is making sure we're getting enough protein so and, and the rule of thumb is really one gram of protein per one pound of body weight just a, a rough estimate for those of you who are wondering so really eating your full meal and then not eating again for a while right so not really so not grazing so i love that you're you're bringing that up as a strategy and a tip that women could do if you have ibs or if you need help with going to the bathroom and making sure of course when you're eating your meal to get enough fiber you know, yeah, actually, would you like to address the supplement piece? Because you raised a couple of interesting insights before we hopped on. Yeah, I mean, you know, when we're talking about fiber, of course, you know, as you could see, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, I have Fiber S behind me. It's my staple, our first product we ever launched as part of Morphous. So Fiber S is a soluble fiber. So again, you can get your soluble fiber from your vegetables like we talked about, or asparagus and onions and garlic for those of you, again, who cannot or can tolerate it. There's other things that you can get it from other vegetables. Um, carrots with the peel on jicama, those kind of vegetables, Jerusalem artichoke, which is why I mentioned that. And then you can take fiber us. Uh, fiber us is actually safe and approved by Monash University, which is why I even love that you mentioned that because it's safe for people who have IBS. So yes. if you do have it, fiber us is completely safe for you. Um, so it'll help you go to the bathroom. I always say, start with quarter scoop, work your way up slowly to that full scoop. Uh, Randy, my business partner, takes two scoops. It's actually safe to take more than that. So depending what you um, what your body needs, uh, it's a really good one ingredient, totally safe, no taste, no grit, no smell, no clumping, nothing. And it's beautiful and it works in everything, hot or cold. And Bonnie and I were talking about before we hopped on, because I had I have and have IBS and I've had it for so many years, I know what triggers mine and stress is definitely a trigger for me. And the way I feel, and again, we're all different, but this is how it it. it plays out for me is I'll start to feel like my colon is starting to spasm. And it when it's once it starts to spasm, that's when you're like, you're just like in so much pain that you're kind of like bent over, <laughs> you can't really do much. 
So one of the thing, two things that I find really helpful for me that helps me in the moment. So of course, everything we talked about what Bonnie mentioned is prevention of IBS, right? So things that can help you uh, before you get to it. But then if let's say, for example, it is triggered and um, you are having a spastic colon, for me, I will take a high dose of fish oil. I'll take about 3,000, 3,500 milligrams of fish oil. I'll, you know, I'll take it, um, I have a, or omega-3 tea and I'll bite into the capsule. So I'll just take a, a few more and I'll bite it and I'll take magnesium bisphosphonate or magnesium. And I find that that will calm my colon down in the moment. Again, that's in that chronic acute stage. Um, but everything else Bonnie talked about is really preventing it to get to that point, but we're human and it's going to happen. So those are two things that really work for me um, yeah. in the, in the heat of the moment, let's say. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. That's really helpful. So, I mean, you always, again, those things are always individualized. I find it interesting that you chose the type of magnesium you chose, because I also suggest magnesium bisglycinate versus citrate, which is what a lot of people will suggest for constipation, but it makes no sense to me because the gut brain connection is so intimate. And I think bisglycinate addresses that better. So if you're taking citrate, because somebody has suggested that to you for all the obvious reasons, you might want to consider um, adding or um, exchanging. I've had clients have a lot of success with that right before bed. They'll take their dose and um, it'll really help loosen up their stools and help in the moment, like you said, which we need, right? You know, it's interesting that you say that about magnesium bisglycinate because my daughter who had a lot of issues, not in menopause, she's 19, <laughs> but or she's going to be 19, like in a couple of weeks. Um, she actually was having a lot of issues with constipation and we tried so many things. And the only thing that seems to be helping her is the magnesium bisglycinate. Mm -hmm. And she is pooping yeah. now every day. She is so happy. And it's the magnesium bisglycinate mm -hmm. versus the citrate that you mentioned. Yeah. So it's an interesting yeah. point. Actually, I've, this is very like, you know, mother-in-law E, but I also have worked with a lot of young women in university, like early, like undergrad university age. So what's that? Like, 19 to 22 or something who are maybe just a few years in on various types of birth control and who also that's another segment of the female population i think that has a really large influx of like all of a sudden these digestive issues plus undergrad can be i guess very stressful um and ma magnesium bliss glycinate is has been very helpful for them as well so yes definitely super that's calming here I like hearing it from somebody who, you know, who has so much background in on the supplement end of things. It is super important. Um, and, you know, we have been talking a lot about prevention, but I work with people who are in literal like flair, um, who have been like, you know, dealing with this for 30 plus years. It's important to deal with things with respect to IBS in um, the moment. And you've mentioned a couple of things that are helpful. The elimination part of the diet, unfortunately, in um, flare can be also very helpful. But the um, layering of all of the multifactorial pieces really have to be patient. But over a period of just a few weeks, you could notice a difference. Yeah. So I was going to say to you, Bonnie, you know, for you know, for the women who are listening, or for those who are listening, um, would you say that? And I know you're going to, I know your answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Would you say that it is very much a, something that we could work with, that we can work to make ourselves feel better to, for those who are in the acute phase right now and who are in the constant flare, what advice do you have for them? Like what words of inspiration do you want to leave them with? So this is a great question. First of all, the answer is 100% yes, because it happens every day in the work that I do, which is thrilling. It really is thrilling, right? Like, I mean, we were joking because I don't know if this is appropriate to say here or not, but I was just on a girls weekend in Collingwood, a ski weekend. And you know how it is when you switch environments and there's other people outside of the bathroom door. So even myself, I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, you can't. And, and like just the power Power of when you finally have that very satisfying bowel movement is just, you know, so yes, it is something you can achieve <laughs> and it is super important. It makes you feel great. But the thing, the thing I would want people to walk away with, because we've mentioned 
quite a few things here. And ultimately, when it comes to something like this that's dysfunctional and chronic it, and not medication reliant, right, it can feel very overwhelming. So people do nothing instead of doing everything. And I think the message I would want to share today is just you don't have to do everything. You have to pick of the things we talked about today, even pick one thing that you kind of inherently feel, oh yeah, I can, there's opportunity here, right? And you can manage and literally dedicate it, dedicate yourself to it for a period of not a few days. You won't see a change in a few days, but try and dedicate yourself to it for a period of at least two to three weeks. And, and I think observation and tracking in this case helps us actually see what the impact is and it makes it bite size it doesn't make it overwhelming yeah. to do it that way so that i think is really really important and actually one other thing that we didn't mention a lot today but when we were talking about fiber supplementation or even increasing daily fiber please always when it, as it relates to digestion you must make sure to well hydrate so mm -hmm. um make sure to get you know when we say six to eight glasses we really mean like as you add fiber to any diet even a diet that currently has 25 to 35 grams as you add fiber you have to add water yeah so fiber helps to move things along the digestive tract but water helps it move even easier and better yeah. And um, so you always want to make sure that you are drinking half your weight in ounces. That's kind of what we go for. So starting your day off with some water or herbal tea, you know, you could do that too. And mm -hmm. um, when, you know, even soups, vegetables have a lot of fiber in it. So it doesn't all have to come from, you know, water that you're drinking. And if you don't like the taste of water, you could, you know, infuse some cucumbers, infuse some fruit or something into it. You can add some, I really love like mint chlorophyll. I love that. They have some drops that you can add. It just makes your water taste so good. Just be mindful if you're going to put lemon in that it can, you know, have an effect on your teeth. So if you're going to do it, drink with a straw or, you know, rinse your mouth. I think it's like an hour after you drink it or something, or something like there's, there's a guideline. You could Google that, but just be mindful of that, that it can have a negative effect on your teeth. And then just, you know, decaf drinks, herbal teas, um, you know, anything that's going to um, get liquid into you would be really important. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. All right. Well, so Bonnie, thank you, by the way, for spending the last hour and a bit with us. Is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with before we end today's interview? Um, just that message that if, you, if you're listening and you're somebody who is genuinely struggling with this, because I, I know the struggle is real. I mean, women land on my doorstep every day who are almost at the point where they can't leave their life, their house. And I know there's a spectrum, but it's not uncommon. So just know you're not actually alone. Um, as I said, Address this not in the whole, but try and pick one or two things that you think you can start to work on to improve your situation based on the advice you heard here. And if you're looking for more resources and access to some um, complimentary support, I really do invite you into my free community Facebook group um, called Shift Into Healthy Habits for Digestion. There's a lot of information, workshops on some of the things we've talked about, um, and hopefully you'll find some resources that are relevant for you there. And we'll put a link to your Instagram page below and, okay. uh, which is right here under your name as well. So you can check Bonnie out, follow her on Instagram. You are very active, which is great. And she is helping us have better digestive health. So we thank you continue to do what you're doing because, because what you're doing is super important. So thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Great talking to you all. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Bonnie talking about all things IBS. I thought it would be a great topic to explore since it's a little bit more niche and many of you are experiencing it as you go into this phase of life. So if you enjoyed it, please share it because the more you share shows you care and please leave a review for Menopause Reimagined. I love listening to what you think about our podcast. Thank you for spending the last hour and a bit with me. I appreciate you and I'll see you at the next interview.